Hello everyone. Welcome to another Friday devotional at Ascent Bible Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. My name is Larry Socha, I'm associate pastor. And today our devotion is on the word victory. We're gonna be looking at several different aspects of victory from a spiritual and biblical perspective. And I, I hope that uh, it speaks to your heart and gives you new perspective. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thankful for your faithfulness to us. We come before you seeking understanding, seeking knowledge, seeking wisdom, seeking direction, power, and strength to proceed through uncertain times. And as we look into your word today, Lord, help us to understand that the victory has already been won and how it applies to our daily life. And we praise you that we have Christ and his spirit in us to guide us through these times. We bless you in his name, amen. So as I said, uh, we're gonna talk about victory. It's a word that probably doesn't need any definition for anybody who's listening to this. Um, it's associated with everything ranging from friendly competition to deadly warfare. It can be between opponents, either friendly or antagonistic, and certainly between enemies who intend each other harm. It leads to exultation and pride versus defeat and humility of the vanquished. The control by the victor and the freedom they have to oppress and bring slavery type situations to those they are victors over. It can be on a physical level or a spiritual. In the physical level, there's teams, there's sports, political rivals and political parties, countries, life, death. On the spiritual level, there's God having victory over Satan, believers and unbelievers in constant battles with each other, the spirit warring against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit, the difference between eternal life or perishing in hell. The stakes vary depending on the nature of the contest or the conflict. But the thing to note is that the supreme issue is that God is waging war. He's waging a war that began in heaven thousands of years ago. And though earth and its people are the perceived battleground, much of the warfare is taking place in the invisible spiritual realm that surrounds us. The, the thing that we as believers have to take to heart is that we are to love the Lord with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And just covering those four areas would be a sermon in itself and how you apply those to life. That's not what today is about. But the real thing that I want to talk about today is the nature of the battle, where it's taking place, how it's taking place, and that though we can't see specifically what's going on in the spiritual realm, we will walk by faith based on what the Word of God tells us and the Spirit of Christ confirms in our hearts as believers. <laughs> Let's look at 1 Samuel 17.47 to get a perspective on this overall supreme battle. This is David responding to Goliath's taunts in the Valley of Elah on the western side of, of Jerusalem in the Shephelah, the, uh, the valleys going down through the mountains toward the um, <laughs> Mediterranean. I'm sorry. 1 Samuel 17, verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth, not with sword, 
and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. At this point, David has not yet assaulted Goliath and Goliath has not approached David. But David is so sure because he's walking by faith. He's walking in the spirit of the Lord. He's sure that the victory is already assured. And, and that's, that's the concept that the word of God would give us as believers. Though we're facing battles on many fronts in this life, in this world, in this pandemic, the victory has already been won, being assured by Christ's victory over death on the cross. And it's interesting how there's a difference between the proclamation and the experience. For instance, in the Garden of Eden, God warned Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of that fruit, if you eat of it, you will surely die. That was a proclamation. It was a, a, an assured sentence or consequence for a specific act. And yet, as we read, the day that they ate of it, they didn't die physically. They lived on. They had children, and more children, and more children, and lived uh, hundreds of years. So what did God mean by the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die? Well, the sentence was pronounced. Their death was as sure as if they had died that instant. There was nothing they could do to reverse it. And so when God proclaimed the victory over the grave, over sin, over death, even though we are still experiencing the consequences of Adam and Eve's behaviors and decisions, that victory is assured. Second Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 15, gives us another perspective. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, this is the prophet speaking, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude coming against you. For the battle is not yours, but God's. So in one very real respect, God is the one waging war. He's waging war against Satan. He's waging war against sin. He's waging war against death. And as we're going to see in just a few minutes, we're in the battle as part of the Lord's army or troops who are in partnership with him. But ultimately, the outcome is his. It's assured the battle is his. Uh, I want to look at Psalm 98, verses 1 and 2, and then tie it to Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9, which anybody who's attended church here for even the most recent months will be familiar with Psalm 118. But in Psalm 98, 1 and 2, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. And we know from context in many verses that Jesus Christ is the right hand, the right arm of the Lord. We know it from Isaiah chapter 40 especially. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. And then in chapter 118, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And as we understand that the battle belongs to the Lord, that's who our confidence must be in, and that's from whom the assurance of victory comes. Finally, on that note, in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, 
and stay on horses or count on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. This is a warning to anyone who's counting on their own strength or they're counting on some government or some leader, charismatic or not, to have a solution for what's going on in this world, especially in the spiritual realm and the battle that's going on there. Don't look to man. Don't look to weapons. Don't look to strength. In fact, the exalted will be humbled and the humble will be exalted. So beyond the supreme issue that God is waging war, the issue for every man, woman, and child is that because of Adam's and Eve's choices way back then, death is our biggest enemy. And without the Lord Jesus Christ and his deliverance from death, we have a big problem. It scares people. They're fearful of death. They're uncertain about what happens in death. They come up with all sorts of philosophies about life after death or no life after death and total annihilation. Our issue, though, became God's issue. And let's look at some of the things that God says to us in Ecclesiastes. Looking in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that mourning is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Why is the day of death better than the day of one's birth? For believers, that is absolutely true. For unbelievers, not so much. But for the believer, the day of death signals the end of the strife, the end of the waiting, the end of the suffering that the world, the flesh, and the devil brings upon mankind. This earth, it's the center. It's the center for the battle. In all the universe, Satan and his demons were cast to the earth. And wickedness and evil were brought here to be brought to an ultimate end. But until that end, everyone suffers from it. Even the earth itself in tribulation of natural disasters. The lives of people in the tribulation of sickness, murder, hatred, sin, wickedness, and ultimately death. So the day of death then for us who are going to the peace of the Lord and to enter into his rest is absolutely better because all of the negative now is behind us. The day of birth, all the negative is in front of you. So the day of death is better than the day of one's birth for believers. And it's better to go to the house of mourning because that reminds us that we need to be prepared to come into the judgment of the Lord on that future day. And we need to pay attention for our souls to understand how God is going to judge and what will bring about that deliverance from the victory of the grave. And then in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 to 6, and then verse 11, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten, and that's speaking of earthly rewards. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished, neither have they any portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So once you're past, the decision is made. Your fate is sealed. And there's no chance for reward 
if you haven't attained it by the Lord Jesus Christ before you passed. And then finally reminding us that God is the determiner of all things, the outcome of all things. In verse 11 of chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Now, in Matthew 26, 39, we start seeing that our issue became God's issue. Speaking of Jesus, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We're all familiar with that verse and we understand that this is Jesus as God in the flesh preparing to take on that battle on a physical level to spiritually defeat the forces of darkness. God has accepted our issue that was brought upon us by Adam and Eve and which we sustain in our own rebellion by taking it upon himself. Colossians 2.15 shows us that he was successful in that endeavor. And having spoiled principalities and powers, this is speaking of Christ, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. This passage by Paul in Colossians is describing how having triumphed over the enemy at the cross, Jesus made a spectacle of them. And the words that are used in the original Greek are the same words that were used by Roman generals. When they vanquished a foe, when they conquered, when they gained victory, over one of the enemies of Rome. They would take the leader, the king, the ruler of that enemy. They would spare their lives temporarily, take them back to Rome, strip them naked, chain them to the chariot, and parade them up and down the streets of Rome while the Roman citizens cheered the general and booed and mocked and spat upon the, the vanquished foe. And that's the words that are used to describe <clears throat> Jesus having spoiled principalities and powers and making a show of them openly, triumphing over them at the cross. So how do we benefit from that? Very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 55, this is the game changer for anyone who fears death. So when this corruptible body shall have put on incorruption, our eternal bodies, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, have we experienced that already? No. We're still in these bodies. We're still in these corruptible bodies. We're still in these mortal bodies. But the proclamation has been made. The outcome is sure. We have the victory over death and the grave by the victory of Christ over the principalities and powers. And again, that is why the day of death is better than the day of birth. Seeing, looking forward to this, Isaiah in chapter 25, verse eight said, he will swallow up death and victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And if God has spoken it, it is a surety 
even if we have yet to experience it. And, and that's where walking by faith rather than by sight is so critical, especially now as things seem to be unraveling very rapidly. One tragedy on top of another, one natural disaster on top of another. Fires raging, over 10% of the population of Oregon fleeing from fires that the winds are blowing northward from California. It's just incredible what we're, what we're viewing. And in Revelation 15, chapter 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Can you, by faith, envision that you already have victory over the things that are plaguing you? You have victory over the fears that the world is trying to lock you up with and oppress you by. We know that wars consist typically of battles. One party moves. The other side counters. That side moves. The first side counters. And there are some battles that you win and some battles that you lose. But it's the end of the war that matters. And we are not to be overly concerned by skirmishes where we might fall behind or fall prey to the enemy when we know that the outcome of the battle, the outcome of the war is already assured by God. Now I want to talk about the nature of warfare. Spiritual warfare is just as true as physical warfare. There are casualties. There are always casualties in war because the hatred that brought about the war and in the case of God versus Satan, Satan's self-exaltation to the throne of God and being cast out of heaven, he has hated God and is at enmity with God and opposes God in every possible aspect that God allows. God being sovereign didn't have to allow Satan to oppose him at all. But in order to show his righteousness, his power, his holiness, and his justice, he could have destroyed Satan on the spot. He created him, he could have destroyed him, but he didn't. And why is that? I can't say for sure because I don't know God's mind perfectly, but I do have to tell you, if God had destroyed Satan right then, he would not have been showing his love, his mercy, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, and his forgiveness in those aspects of his character. So by allowing Satan to continue and by limiting what he could do, he brought those concepts on his loving side to us, his redeemed people. And now we will clearly see both that side of God and the ultimate righteousness and glory of God and power of God in the coming judgment. And you will see a complete God. It doesn't come easy. Warfare doesn't come easy. There's destruction. There's devastation. The, the sides are battling. Every square inch in the spiritual realm is being contested to the degree that God permits the rebellion. And throughout this rebellion, people are being proven either to be enemies of God or children of God. And because of the nature of time, 
and all generations requiring time to come into their own time frame. This has been a long, drawn-out, protracted war for thousands of years. And the destruction and the devastation on the earth and in lives has been amazing. War always requires courage and sacrifice on the part of those involved. And you're either going to be on the one side or the other, or if you're not fighting, you're going to be a refugee fleeing the battle. But regardless of your role, it requires courage and sacrifice. And what we don't really understand a lot of times is that the ultimate impact of most actions, it's uncertain until later, possibly even until the end. And <laughs> the smallest thing may make the biggest impact in the end. Uh, you may, have, may be familiar with this saying, but something that brings that to um, a greater understanding is the saying, for want of a nail, or for lack of a nail, the shoe was lost. This is speaking of a horseshoe. For lack of a shoe, the horse was lost. For lack of a horse, the rider was lost. For lack of a rider, the battle was lost. And for lack of the battle, or loss of the battle, the war was lost. And so the whole outcome of the war hinged on one missing nail in the shoe of a horse. That gives you an understanding for how the smallest thing can make the greatest impact. And so those of us who are not great, strong, powerful, charismatic believers in the Lord, all we have to do is the smallest part. And just as God takes the two fish and the five loaves and feeds 5,000, he can take your small effort, your small obedience, that one seed that you sow, and turn it into a tremendous victory. So do not fail. Do not resist doing the small thing that you can do that God is calling you to. Recognize everyone is battling something or someone in this world because this is not an easy world to live in. It has its trials. The storms of life come. Everybody faces that ultimate journey across the Jordan from death into eternity. And will they make it into the promised land or they, will they be lost forever like the rich man who called out to Abraham, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue, for it is on fire here. Everyone is battling something, and they must overcome if they are to gain victory, whether that be the world, the flesh, or the devil. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17, puts it in perspective, warns us, if we're walking by faith, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So don't let those physical desires appeal to you and draw you away from the Lord. Don't let that hunger for greed, wealth, fame, power, the lust of the eyes, draw you away. Don't let the pride of life that causes people to exalt themselves to the position of God in their very lives, exactly the guilt of Satan, Lucifer, when he was in heaven, 
Don't let those things draw you away. Because those things don't come from the Father. They come from the world. And the world passeth away. And the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What is the will of God? We look in, in the Gospel of John. The will of God is to believe in the one he has sent. And then in 1 John 5, verses 4, 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The call. You want to be victorious? Overcome. 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 The world, the flesh, the devil, the fear, the doubt, the weakness, the desire, the rebellion. Read Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Jesus speaking to the seven churches talks about overcoming seven different ways. I won't get into that now. But the question is, are you living a life of victory or of defeat? Do your attitudes, your words, your actions support or betray any possible claim of victory? You got to know your part in the battle. Again, understand the four most important victories in this battle are Christ's victory over his adversary, making an example of him and a, a spectacle of him. <laughs> Christ's victory over death and the grave, which he defeated and we benefit from. Your victory in overcoming the world, the flesh and the devil. And finally, as your testimony of victory becomes sure and your words and your actions and your attitudes are in line with the truth of that victory, no matter what you view, no matter what you observe in this world, living by faith, the victory of winning other souls for God's kingdom and glory. So your part, gear up. Go to Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Finally, <laughs> my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, because it's his battle. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You better understand, Satan is real. The demons are real. They are not messing around, and they are bringing all of the power that God has permitted them to bear in this current battle. They're not to be trifled with. Take them seriously. Put on the armor of God and be strong in his might and in his power because you in and of yourself do not have the strength to withstand such massive opponents. And yet, compared to the power of God, they, your opponents, are weak and feeble and cannot do anything that God does not permit. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And we are in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins good about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Gear up. God has given you what you need. Make sure you know your equipment, you have it with you, and you know, become proficient in using it. Train, condition, strengthen yourself for the battle. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I'm not shadow boxing, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. As a teacher of the word, as a preacher of salvation, I prepare myself for the battle knowing that Christ's enemy is my enemy. And you, if you are in God's army, a son of God, a daughter of God, no. If they hate you, it's because they hated him first. Get yourself in shape for the battle. They're going to bring it on. It's going to be tough. But you will prevail if you respond by the word of God training up, beating your body, being temperate, taking on the armor of God, and getting ready for whatever arrows the enemy throws at you. You will be able to quench those arrows. Trust and obey your commander. 2 Timothy 2, 3-5. to Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. There's a lot of civilian affairs. You can get involved in political issues. You can get involved in financial issues, social issues, and they're not bad things necessarily. But the real issue is, what is the business that God is in? What is the business that Christ is in? Christ says, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If, if it was, my followers would be battling Rome. Christ told the Pharisees, bring me a coin whose inscription is on the coin. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but render unto God that which is God's. So while he walked this earth, he obeyed the righteous legal laws of man, but he didn't concern himself with political issues. And he didn't overthrow the Roman government the way the people wanted it to, and he paid the ultimate price for that. But in doing so, he brought victory over death and the grave. Finally, know your enemy and know yourself. Understand the enemy is going to use lies. The enemy is going to use those you love to try to make you think that they're your enemies and that you are their enemy. And he's going to pit us against each other. Know his wiles. Know that he ambushes you. Know that he uses false information and lies to confuse and distract. Know that he ambushes you. 
and know how to recognize his ways and how to avoid them. Know yourself. Again, you're not strong like you think you might be. You're not wise like you think you might be unless you have the wisdom of God and the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. And then, if you do, you don't depend on your own strength. Like Paul said, when I'm weak, then I am strong. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need the Lord. Philippians 3, 12 to 15, he's going to progress you through growth to spiritual maturity, to spiritual strength. And Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm going to pursue greater growth, greater spiritual maturity, because that's what Christ apprehended me for, or brought me into the family of God for. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I know I'm still not there, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Paul saying, keep pressing on. You may not agree with me on everything right now, but eventually, as you grow, because the Holy Spirit is the guide and the teacher, he's going to guide you to the same truth he's already guided me to, and we're eventually going to see eye to eye on this. So, if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. And the last verse, 2 Peter 1, 2 to 8. Grace and peace, this is my prayer, be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Walk by faith in those promises. These are great and exceeding and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, it's the divine nature, the Spirit of God living in you that empowers you to these things. <clears throat> Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Do not love the things of the world. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they will bring to you the victory that is already won, that is already assured, is already promised. God be with you.